Good morning. My name is Lynn Evans, and I'm the director of the Women's Leadership Initiative here at the University of Delaware. And welcome to all of you for the third in our series, Trailblazers and Changemakers. We are thrilled to bring you this series highlighting women who are truly making a difference. And although their areas of expertise and their backgrounds are quite different, there is a common thread that runs through all of their stories, and that is advocating for social justice and for change and for equity. They are all leaders and today is no exception. If you've missed any of our past webinars, we'd invite you to go back online and listen. They are free and they are also available for facilitated discussions. And here we have upcoming uh, the, the final two webinars in this series, uh, Fighting for Health Equity and Women Winning in Athletics. So if it's not already on your schedule, I hope that you will join us for those webinars. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Without them, we would not be able to bring you this series for free. We are grateful for the support of Barclays, Delaware Today, Delaware Business Times, InvestNet, and Wawa. And today, we'd like to give special thanks to our UD sponsor, PNC, with a message from Senior Vice President, Rosemary Gorman. Good morning, and thank you for that introduction, Lynn. My name is Rosemary Gorman, and I'm a relationship strategist with PNC Bank. PNC is delighted to be a sponsor of this timely and important webinar series. In fact, it is closely aligned with a key area focus for us. PNC places a high importance on elevating women in the workplace. We have more than 3,000 PNC certified women business advocates across our network who deliver business and personal financial products and services and the resources that you need to thrive. There are well-established strong arguments for supporting advocating for women in business. The World Economic Forum recently published a survey indicating the economic gender gap has closed an average of 15% annually between 2006 and 2019. At that rate, it predicts it will take 257 years for women to economically catch up to men. So why does PNC think that this is important? Because helping women accelerate accelerates economic growth. Many of us know what's driving the gap. How can we help close it? Leading by example with family-friendly employee benefits and programs, by inspiring women to consider typically male-dominated roles and industries, and by enhancing access to capital. PNC is committed to financial equity for women, and we applaud the University of Delaware for presenting this series to empower women. Thank you for your time, and I now turn the program over to Lynn Evans. Thank you, Rosemary, and thank you, PNC, for your partnership. We cannot thank you enough for the support that you have shown uh, for Women's Leadership Initiative here at the University of Delaware. And of course, we look forward to working with you uh, going forward as well. And so again, before we dive into our program, I wanted to mention, um, as we have uh, for the past couple of weeks, that we now have an online version of our Women's Leadership Initiative uh, certificate program. It has been an, an overwhelming success. We sold out our first cohort, which launched in February, and uh, we have added another cohort that starts April 30th. We have a few seats left. If you would uh, like to uh, consider attending, please reach out and let us know. If you are looking to boost your career trajectory or change careers, I highly recommend that you look into this program. And as always, we're obliged to let you know that we are in a Zoom video webinar, which means you can see and hear us, but we cannot see and hear you. Um, but as always, we encourage you to put your comments and your questions into the chat. Um, we love the interaction that we have with you in the chat room. Uh, we will try to get to as many questions as we can, um, probably stopping uh, uh, around halfway through the program and make sure that we really do a deep dive for the issues that are important to you. Um, we will be live tweeting 
um, the, the webinar today. And if you are too, we would encourage you to use, uh, to tag us at UD Women Lead with the hashtags Trailblazing Women. And for this particular webinar, we'd also encourage you to tag or to hashtag Rinku Rights. And so now I'm going to move on and introduce our speaker, Rinku Sen. As I have found out as I've read her books and done more research around the Women's March in the past um, few weeks and actually a few months, I've learned that Rinku is a lot of things. She is a social activist, she is a researcher and organizer and thought leader on topics such as equity, gender, immigration, and race. An immigrant herself, Rinku was born in India and came to the U.S. with her family when she was five years old. She is the author of Stir It Up, it Lessons in Community Organizing, and The Accidental American, Immigration and Citizenship in the Age of Globalization. Rinku is the past president of Race Forward and editor of the news site Color Lines. Prior to that, she was the leader in the Center for Third World Organizing. And currently, she is the executive director of the Narrative Initiative and co-president of the Board of Directors of the Women's March. A true change maker, it is my pleasure to welcome Rinku Sen to our webinar series. Thank you so much, Lynn. Really thrilled to be with you. Oh, we are thrilled to have you. Um, I uh, admittedly have probably 50 or more questions that I want to ask. I think the breadth of your research and your experience in your career is, is a bit overwhelming, but it all does seem to fall into a, an arc. And um, so I hope that we can touch on uh, the high points of that today. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so I thought I'd start out though with um, the question to um, let everyone know how did you become a social activist and an organizer? Where did that begin? For me, it really started in college. I was a sophomore in 1984. And in the first week of that academic year, there was an incident of racial violence on our campus. I was at Brown University, 1984. And uh, during that first week, I was at my friend Valerie's room with our other friend Yuko. And the next day, the two of them were going to go to a rally that the Black Student Organization had called to um, address this, this uh, racial violence incident that had happened. And when my fr friends uh, first told me about it and said, we're going to this rally, you should come too. I said no, actually, I had no, um, I, I was not like a red diaper baby or raised in a highly political household. I was an immigrant child in very white communities growing up trying to fit in and find my place. So, so activism and racial justice was not a regular part of my life at that point. And um, my friends did a little intervention on me. They said, Rinku, you're not a girl anymore. You're a woman now. And you're not a minority. You're a person of color. And really, it was the first time I had heard the phrase person of color or people of color. And, you know, sometimes when your friends push you that hard, you it, it drives you in the opposite direction. But for me, I decided to go see. And I went to this slightly straggly rally the next day, about 20 people walking in circles around our green with handmade signs and um, putting out their initial demands. And inexplicably, for the first time in 12 years, I felt a sense of belonging that I did not know I had been missing. Um, I wouldn't have said, oh, hey, to be really happy and to feel completely American, I need to go participate in organizing. But that was the moment when I figured out that being an American wasn't about looking like Marsha Brady. I'm gonna assume our audience knows who Marsha Brady is and um, eating hot dogs for dinner, what, what I thought Americans did. It was about 
being with other Americans, being in a community and doing your best together to make that community as inclusive and compassionate and effective as possible. And um, long story short, we won that campaign there. One of the biggest things we won was a new uh, center for students of color. At the time, we called it the Third World Center. Uh, it had been in the basement of the Afro-American Studies Department, and we got a whole new building all for ourselves. Um, won a bunch of changes in faculty and curriculum. And then later that year, near the end, I participated in a campaign around women's safety on campus that was also successful. So what I learned in that year was that if you get together with people like you, including your friends and the people around you, you identify the issues that are, are making life harder and the solutions that could make life easier, and you challenge the institution that you're in, the systems that you're in to change, you can actually win. And once I understood that, I was pretty much sold. And um, that's what started me on my on a path of really organizing and social change as a career. So it's interesting, as you say, that was your, your intro to organizing. And I, and I just want to hold this up because I have read it cover to cover, your book you wrote in 2003. It, it's really a handbook of, of the history of organizing as well as how to do it. And what struck me is that um, there are so many different ways of organizing it, it, some better than others. It, maybe you could touch on like what makes a successful movement or, or conversely, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I maybe want to do is distinguish organizations from movements mm -hmm. because they are different. Organizations um, help to create movements, help to sustain movements. And when movements are happening, organizations are part of it. Organizations are the building block of movements. But a big difference between them is that um, movements tend to be very decentralized. That's what makes them movements that spun, um, somewhat spontaneously, lots of people who don't know each other, but who get inspired by um, the examples, by each other's examples, begin to replicate an activity and repeat a demand. So we really saw that last summer when George Floyd was killed, that Minneapolis Black organizations and organizers in Minneapolis uh, started meeting that particular moment, but they had been in place for a long time, some of them for a decade or more. So those organizations, uh, because of their strength, were able to create a groundswell in Minneapolis. That's the organizational part. But then lots of people all over the country hit the streets around their own police departments, their own local examples of people who had been um, killed by the police. And, and then suddenly within about 48 hours, we were in movement. It, um, and the way you know that is that you can see that there's not a small group of people telling everyone else what to do. People are deciding for themselves what to do, but they're all focused on a central goal. In this case, um, stopping the police from killing Black people. So what makes strong organizations to me are that they have an actual strategy. And the way I understand strategy is that it has three components. One is a constituency, a community, people that you are actually organizing and organizing with. The second is a solution, a goal, a demand. They know what needs to happen in order to make life better for this community. And um, in direct action organizations, like the kind I come out of, um, the third element is a clear target, someone that um, is in the system uh, who can actually meet your demand, who can implement your solution, who can, who can advance your goal. 
And if you have those three things, plus a little money, you've got an organization, you've got members, you've got a goal, you've got a plan for getting, uh, for reaching your goal and for delivering that victory or that solution to your community. Um, those are the things that make for successful organizations. And what makes for successful movements is that there are lots of those units in action at the same time in a mass way, um, in such a way that the uh, media, the systems, and the uh, nation can't ignore it. And so you basically can't have one without the other in, in terms it's of- It's hard to have movements, movements without any organizations. Um, if you study the history of the civil rights movement, for example, there were so many organizations working sometimes for 50 years or more. There was an entire mutual, a mutual aid network among black people in this country that operated through churches and through civic black civic organizations, black sororities and fraternities. And, um, you know, for example, 15 years before the Freedom Riders got on buses and rode through the South to help desegregate the South, um, uh, CORE, the organization CORE, had run a test, uh, a much smaller test, but Black and white riders getting on buses, riding from North to South, and um, without that organization and that test, that experiment 15 years before the Freedom Riders try it again at a larger scale, um, you, you wouldn't have a peak of a civil rights movement between 1955 and 1968, say. Um, it's, it's the organizations that got built in the 40s and the 30s and the 20s, um, and some of them in 1960, that um, that anchored that movement and that gave the movement the space, the money, the know-how, the leadership development to hit the mass moments that um, they trusted were coming. You can't always control the opportunity for that moment, but you can always be getting ready for it by having strong organizations. And not let that opportunity pass because you don't have that infrastructure basically Correct. in place. Exactly. So turning to the Women's March, because that is such a phenomenon and you know is in our recent history, we're not going back 50 or a hundred right. years, we, we, mm -hmm. we saw it happen. Can you comment on that? Now that you've made me think, were there things in place that made that happen or What's unique about the Women's March compared to, to your other research? Yeah, well, the Women's March is, has been a completely unique experience for me entirely. Honestly, I've never been involved in something so large that so many people were involved in and that um, in its short history has had such intense scrutiny from all angles, right, left, middle. And um, I think what is so remarkable about Women's March is it really was um, initially a spontaneous outpouring without, in fact, a lot of organization behind it. In fact, I'd say the organization that was um, very present at the beginning was actually social media. That is a form of organization. And we could say that Facebook, in fact, was the organization that grounded the, the call for women to march. So um, once that call happened, um, a leadership committee body board was recruited that included four co-chairs, um, four co-chairs, and um, millions of women turned out in January of 2017, not just here in this country, but all over the world. It is the largest demonstration in uh, certainly in US history and maybe in global history as a global demonstration. So the big challenge for Women's March was um, going from a mobilization where lots of people turn out for a one-time thing and turning that into organization where people would keep coming back. 
Um, one super unique thing about the Women's March to me is that 70% of the marchers that first year, that was the first thing they had ever done. They had never been to a protest. They had never uh, walked on a picket line. They had never been to a march. They were not organizers or activists. They were everyday women who, who were motivated, moved by the moment that we were in, by the threat we were facing to hit the streets. And what Women's March has worked really hard to do since then is give all those first timers an on-ramp to ongoing feminist action um, and to, to teach some of the skills of local self-organizing and, um, and as, a, as a national organization to keep doing rapid response as things were happening that affected women all over the country. I, I've just been really excited by the return to feminism mm -hmm. um, by, I, I, I love the word feminist. I think of myself as a feminist. I'm all about claiming everything that's good in that word. And Women's March kind of jump-started a 21st century feminist, um, jump-started 21st century feminist organizing among women who had not already been doing it, which um, of course, there were many who had been doing it, but Women's March allowed us to grow all of those organizations um, by directing hundreds of thousands of first timers into what it means to, to speak out in an ongoing way and what it means to work with your friends and neighbors to make things better. I love that you use that term on ramp because it feels in you know, a community or a country, what can I do? I, I'm so busy, I'm so overwhelmed and I can't go and be the you know, president of a local board. I can't, but this is like, yes, you can come in and, and it sounds like, and we'll let you do whatever it is that you can do, but you're contributing um, to, to that. You yeah. know, the one thing that struck me is I read more about the women's March, you know, back in early days of the end of 2016 and early, um, 2017 is, um, and it kind of connects to your book when you talk about the identity of, mm -hmm. of a March, this is encompassing all women. And we have talked about it, women's leadership and in, in research, we're not a monolithic group. So how, how, how do you um, deal with that aspect of the constituency? Mm -hmm. uh, so communities have lots of different interests. Women, even a single woman is not a monolith. She has uh, feelings about different things. She um, spends her time in different ways and with different people. Every hour of a single, of a, an individual woman's life is not the same. We're not doing the exact same thing hour after hour. So our lives are multidimensional and our organizations and the issues, the way we pick our issues and design demands and solutions and um, changes around our issues need to be that way as well. Now, every organization does not need to organize everybody. There's, um, I'm, I favor organizations that are um, clear about who they're trying to organize and that really gear themselves toward, they, they build their um, act, activist mechanisms toward that community. So for example, if you're organizing women with disabilities, then you have to have different on-ramps than uh, for women without disabilities. You have to be able to accommodate um, the ways in which they do their work and the issues um, the way that different issues and systems are affecting them. So um, any organization can develop its own constituency, and some of them are going to be narrower definitions of that constituency, and some are going to be broader definitions. Women's March National is broadly defined. It's for all women in the United States. Um, who share our, the values of the organization and of each other. And um, so it's a multiracial organization and we constantly have to be um, 
uh, producing programs that can appeal to a broad range of women across race and class and geography. But that doesn't mean that there isn't tons of room for specific kinds of women to get together and organize with each other because they, they need that focus um, and they need to be able to develop an internal culture that's comfortable for those women in particular. Um, so I think some of the other things that, that create identity for organizations is, you know, what kind of tactics are you using that, that, signals to people what your personality is. And again, lots of room across a political spectrum of different kinds of tactics. Some organizations are more staid, shall we say, in their tone. Um, they work through the legal system, or maybe they're running people for office, or they, um, they're faith-based. All of these um, ways of being feed and shape an organizational culture and an organizational identity. And then people start coming to you knowing, oh, these are the folks who can um, help us pull off a civil disobedience. That's what they do. They're, they're willing to challenge the system in that way by disrupting it and by um, getting in the streets, making, making good trouble as John mm -hmm. Lewis uh, liked to say, and they're willing to risk arrest for that. Um, this other organization over here, they're going to file our lawsuit. Um, they're going to, uh, this other organization over here, they're going to raise our money. So there are lots, there are so many contributions to make. And whether you're the person who's very attracted to hardcore direct action, or you'd rather write about it, or you'd rather um, explain it to people who don't understand it but should support it, there's a role for you in movement. It's just a matter of figuring out what that role is and who the people are that you're going to do it with. I think what I like or what seems so appealing about the Women's March is the fact that women are not going to divide themselves along all you know, hundreds and hundreds of ways that we could find as human beings to be different from each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's going to come with some strife and, and, and issues. And um, so it's, it's reassuring to me that, and maybe that's where women can excel. We hope, we always say we're the peacemaker, we're not the fighter or, you know, whatever's in our DNA. Um, so I, I think there was initial disappointment in the controversy. And, and there was a part of me that was feeling like the Women's March was getting a lot of bad press for doing, creating an organization out of a spontaneous movement. And um, it seems as if um, it's, it's weathered that well, uh, you know, a, a little bit of a rocky start. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it was so huge. It's like when you, when you create something that big, and maybe you know it's going to be that big. Maybe you don't. We don't. We don't always know how things are going to turn out. Um, it, it's. Uh, it was inevitable that Women's March was going to become a target. First, a target of the right. And um, I know, for example, that the White House paid a lot of attention to Women's March. And um, and yeah, paid a lot of attention. Scrutinized. Tracked. Um, and I also know that when you build something big like that, that has a lot of different kinds of, uh, people in it that, um, some folks on the left are going to be disappointed too, mm -hmm. are going to find it inadequate or, um, not radical enough or, uh, problematic in some other way. So I think the, the big challenge for us was to, um, focus on the marchers, mm -hmm. in fact, and to figure out how to deliver to marchers what they needed to organize. Um, the goal of all this is to organize. And, you know, we did a ton of work throughout the election. We made millions of phone calls and texts. And one of the uh, wonderful things to me was I had a friend who was uh, doing 
uh, get out the vote calls during the election. And she did it one week with the uh, Democratic Party, with the Biden-Harris campaign. And she did it the next week with the Women's March. And she said that she had so many more people willing to talk when she was calling as a women's marcher than when she was calling as a um, supporter of the campaign directly. And, you know, it's hard to, you can't buy that kind of trust, you, uh, and name recognition. You have to actually organize for it. And you can't even always predict it. I don't, I don't think the founders of the Women's March knew that they were about to pull off the largest mobilization in U.S. history. Um, you, you just don't always know, but you take risks. Um, you try to read the, the tea leaves and the atmosphere as best you can, take a risk, and sometimes a great thing happens. So, um, you know, I think at Women's March, we just... We try to stay focused on what the, you know, almost 2 million women on our mailing lists need to move forward. And, um, and they've responded by moving forward. <laughs> so that makes us think we should keep going and that the organization is worth preserving and growing. I also love what you just said about taking risks right? There is not the reward if you don't as a, an organization. And in fact, that would be a common thread in your, in your book. Now that I think mm -hmm. about it and all of the examples you use, there's, there's no guarantee. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, I think even as individuals, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's what we're, we're obliged uh, to do. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to switch gears just a little bit, although it's not a big switch and, and talk about your work um, with the narrative initiative um, I just have to say, I love that on the front, the the first, the front page. Listen, as if it's a book. I'm on the the first <laughs> digital page. Um, <laughs> it's screen it's, sucks. It's all <laughs> exactly that first screen. Shifting deep narratives in order to make equity and social social justice common sense. I thought that was about the best sentence I've ever read. Like, why are we even arguing about this? You know, making it common sense. But I, can you can you comment on on your work? around um, changing the narrative or why that is so important? Yeah, so I think the place I'm gonna start is that the human brain, um, our brains are wired for story. And there's actually a great book called Wired for Story, which is a book about writing stories and writing fiction, but it's grounded in, the, uh, in an analysis a neurological analysis of what our brains like. And um, over time, since we've had language as human beings, we have told stories to each other and we've listened to stories because um, it's too boring to have someone lecture at you that there's a tiger behind the bush and you should run. And if you had to learn that only from experience, then the tiger would get you more <laughs> often than not. So our brains evolved to love stories because um, stories engage our emotions and they, um, they also teach us lessons. So the way the human brain incorporates lessons is through stories. Um, I'll just give you one little nugget that I've always found really interesting. When, the, when we're watching or reading or listening to something <clears throat> that is really engaging, where we're really involved in the characters and we want to know what happens and we are invested in it, when, when certain things happen in the story, your body, the body of the consumer goes through the same reactions that the protagonist is going through. So if you've ever watched Beaches and cried at the end, or you um, watched a horror movie and you flinched when the monster you know, jumped out from the closet or whatever, that is your brain investing in that story 
and feeling, actually feeling the things that the protagonist is feeling. So just imagine the effect of that from a social justice standpoint, that if you can get through your storytelling, people's body, people to have a bodily experience of the problem that you are describing and that you want them to work on, then you've got them. That's what happened to me when my friends talk to me about going to the rally, you know, that's an abstraction, an important conversation, very important, but it didn't happen for me until I felt something in my body the next day at that rally. So this is why storytelling and narrative are extremely important to social change, um, critically important. If you leave it out, you're going to win less. That is, that is my um, pitch for the work. And um, just to think about deep narrative, the storytelling is critical, but when the stories stack on top of each other and they accumulate, and if that happens over many years, over a decade, over 20 years, 50 years, that's when the common sense um, element starts to kick in. Repetition matters a lot. You can't hear a story one time and be convinced and have it become part of your way of being. Um, you, you hear the story many times in different forms, with different characters, in different settings, and that repetition starts to trigger a frame, a worldview, in, in your mind. Um, and that's how people's politics and values begin to shift or how um, the values and politics that might be dismissed by, by someone else's narrative um, start to consolidate and find their, um, you start to find your voice to to uh, name those values and name the solutions that are important to you. So narrative is super, super, super important. And it's also really fun work. If you're a person who um, is a TV addict like myself um, or uh, love to read novels and you wonder how you might fit into social justice work, this is where you fit. It's in changing the, um, uh, it's in making narratives of community and compassion and power and freedom, um, in this case for women, making those stories, making those stories and uh, so that people can engage them and um, change. Elizabeth Lesser talked about that. Uh, when she was here a couple of weeks ago um, of how it changes history. Um, it, and and one, one thing that you brought up, it's really important you alluded to is the political narrative. Mm -hmm. And I, perhaps other times in history, it's been worse, but you talk about political sectarianism. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about that as it relates to, say, the Women's March or other organi organizations and this polarization mm -hmm. that, that we're struggling with right now. Yeah, yeah um, I think when we were talking yesterday, I was telling you about a study that had happened um, that showed that that political polarization in the U.S. is worse than it is in other countries. We um, We don't just think that um, people who oppose our ideas have a different set of ideas. We think that they have a different morality than we do. And um, we're making moral judgments about um, based on people's political choices. And I, I'm not saying those moral judgments are inappropriate. Maybe they are appropriate, but we're making them in a country that has a two party system. There's very little political space for uh, not Republicans and not Democrats. And, and it's extremely winner take all. That's our political system. If you win an election, you win it all. And you don't have to share power. You don't have to build an agenda. Uh, unlike other, uh, unlike representative democracies like European countries have, or even India, the country I come from has. 
So our system forces us into camps that are very distinct because there are only two of them. <laughs> and um, I mean, there are many more than two of them, but our system only really recognizes two of them. So that um, creates a level of polarization that is a little bit uncommon in the world, in fact, in, in large democracies. And um, the really interesting thing I found about that study is that it said that when we um, are opposed to the other side, it doesn't make us love our side anymore. So it's not like we're, we're opposing someone else and in that opposition, opposition coming closer to each other uh, as a group of people who oppose that, um, the other. And what I worry about is that 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 signals to me that our bonds are shredding throughout society, even within our own communities where we are doing our organizing and where we want to be uh, consolidated and and cohesive so that we can move forward on the enormous problems that we have to solve for ourselves. And as an organizer, I was always taught that you want to polarize. Polarization is a really critical aspect of successful campaigning because you have to present choices to people based on a value um, and get them to choose your way. But once you win, you have to bring the community back together again. And that's the part that I think we we need to really think hard about as um, political people, as organizers, as change makers, um, what, polariz what kind of polarization is necessary to, to put the choice in front of people. There are choices to be made. Um, and what will we do after we win? To um, win or lose, how do we keep people together to um, fight for the next thing, the bigger thing, and to actually implement the changes that we might have won or established. Well, it's really uh, interesting. I had not thought about the fact that it doesn't make us, you know, tight knit around our common ideology at, mm -hmm. at all. You know, I want to take a, a moment now and invite Maria Lilly to join us. Um, Maria, welcome. Um, I, you've met Rinku, and just to introduce you to our audience, Maria is a senior biomedical engineer student here at the University of Delaware. Um, she is the co, this is where about the organizing, I love it. She is the co executive director of UD Dance, which, for those of you who don't know, is the largest student philanthropy group on campus and it supports uh, childhood cancer. I know Maria couldn't join a, a call with me because she was so busy organizing this. So good for you. Um, and uh, also you are involved with the Perry Initiative, which inspires women, younger women to become involved in uh, and be leaders in science and medicine. So um, Maria, I know you have questions as well. And, uh, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on Rinku. I so many questions after hearing you speak about everything, like the narrative shift, the polarization. But I think one of my big questions is just with this narrative shift, it's so applicable for organizations, for movements. I think even with the Women's March and the movement this summer that's still continuing, we see this narrative shift and how it progresses and continues throughout time. But I also think it's applicable even like applying it to a personal person, because I think people join people. And that's a big thing. They join the story behind a person. Mm -hmm. And one question I had specifically for you was just, how has your narrative changed over the time that you've been advocating for social justice? Like you talked in the beginning about a sense of belonging when you joined, but what really made you stay and continue and keep fighting? Wow, that's a really great question. Thank you so much for asking it. And um I think that a, part of what has changed for me is figuring out what was my highest value in movement work. And I started as an organizer, but in fact, I'm not the best organizer I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm good on certain parts of it and not so good on other parts of it. And um, 
after organizing for about 15 years, I took myself off to journalism school. So I, I got my bachelor's, I went to work, and it wasn't until more than a decade later that I really, uh, actually, after I wrote Stir It Up, I was, um, that I was thinking a lot about not just what needed to happen in the movement around narrative and communications, but what I was good at and what I enjoyed doing. And I always say that there are so many roles to play in social justice work that you can find one that suits you and it has to make you happy as well as being effective um, for, for the work itself, for the larger context. And so it, to me, it doesn't matter if you're a doctor, you're an artist, you're a teacher, you're a reader, um, you are a musician, you're a door knocker, you know, you're, whatever your personality is, whatever your talents are, there's something for you to do. And it's okay to try to find that thing rather than um, doing, making the contributions to social change that other people tell you you should be making. So um, go, go find your own path. I think that has been the, um, that's been a lesson I've, I've been growing into and I'm still growing into all these decades later. Absolutely. And I think that's a big thing too, even just when you're talking about those first time women that came out for the march and just like rallying around their voices being heard where it's not always like the same pathway for every person. And you're such a big advocate and your voice is being heard, but what advice do you have for women to get their collective voices heard and to really join a movement? Like how do you keep them in the movement? Well, my advice for having your voice heard is the first piece of advice is to raise it. So you can't be heard if you don't speak. So, um, you know, make the meme, um, write the tweet, uh, write the Instagram essay, uh, get on that stage and give a talk, uh, whatever your mode is, raise it. I do want to encourage us as women to think about two other things. One is, um, how, who's going to hear our voice. So when you're thinking about as a, as a group of women raising your voices or making a point, really ask yourself, who's our audience? Um, I just, I, I, I want the audience question to become second nature to all of us. As soon as I think about putting out anything, my next question to myself is who is my audience? And then what are your, how are you going to distribute it? How are you going to make sure it gets heard? So we create a lot of content that, you know, not too many people see and um, that we kind of hope some internet magic will make it go viral or something. But the way to get people to see your stuff is to organize them to see your stuff. So, um, so feel free to raise your voice collectively and individually um, think about your audience and think about your um, distribution platforms and how you're going to get that out. And that can be as simple as putting a crate on a street corner and standing up on it with um, a handheld remote mic and talking. Absolutely. And I think too, with that and the audience and everything, how has that shift been with the pandemic? And we talk about this polarization that we're in right now in our country, but then also the pandemic like exacerbates it and makes it even larger because there's this big connect. So how do we continue then with the storytelling and shifting the narrative long-term? Yeah, I think the pandemic um, has definitely made it hard for us to connect with people in the ways that we used to, but I think for some of us, it's actually opened up communication and opened up community because um, things that you used to have to do in person, now you can do online without anybody judging you for it. And, um, and I hope that, that, that in workplaces, for example, we, um, we don't go back to the old ways entirely. Um, I also think that an under-recognized, it's so easy 
in the pandemic where we have lost so many people, so many people, more than half a million people just in this country alone, um, it's really easy to think about all that has gone wrong. But there are some things that we would not have experienced without the pandemic. Um, The re- rise and reinvention of mutual aid as a way of being and a way of taking care of each other. Um, That's really important. The, um, you know, part of the reason that I think George Floyd's murder had such a big effect is because people were at home and not commuting, not, you know, not working in the same way. And um, I just don't know that that, 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 incident of which there are dozens at least every year would have sparked so much activism and change if we weren't in a pandemic. Um, So I think it's important for us to, to turn our brains toward what did we learn from this time about each other and about being a community and try to carry some of those lessons forward. Rinku, if I could just um, step in, there's there's a really good question coming from the chat. Um, And this person is originally from Latvia saying that, you know, culturally perhaps there's there's not the same level of participation or maybe more of acceptance that you would find in in other countries. Mm -hmm. But the, the question is, What do you suggest as a way of motivating people to speak up and believing they have the power to make change? You know, I really think that in um, situations where there has, where silence has been the mode for whatever set of reasons, um, uh, and I do think understanding the systemic reasons for that being the case in any particular place is important. It's not just that people um, in Latvia are different personality wise from people in the US. Um, There are, um, uh, and I don't know a lot about the history of Latvia, um, but I would imagine that there were cultural policies, policies related to the press, policies related to protest that over time create, changed the culture and, and um, made it more, more quiet. So in a situation like that, one idea is that you need proof of concept that speaking out is not going to um, result in some terrible harm and can actually result in some good. And, um, I know people who have been involved in exchanges, global exchanges between U.S. activists and Eastern European activists, for example, who um, just learned from each other about how to take a first step. So I I think if you're going to encourage a community in in Latvia to to move politically, that you'd want to start small you'd want to study some examples of other places in the world where people in a similar situation had taken action. Um, And you'd, uh, you know, I think risk management is a real thing in, in activism, particularly in places where repression is the norm. So um, I'm never a person who says just ignore the risk. You want all of your people to assess the risk with real information in addition to their feelings and then take the level of action they feel able to take. It might not be the same kind of action as um, we would see here in Austin, Texas, where, where I live. And that's okay. Um, so unfortunately, we are We've only got a few more uh, minutes, Rinku. That's really unfortunately. Um, but always in the vein of ending on a high note or what I would hope would be a high note, what has struck me as I've read your books, heard you speak, is that it seems that you are an optimist. And I think you would have to be to be doing this for so many years and you know, being able to kind of get back up. You know, are, are you optimistic about the future? You know, what, and what is, and what makes you feel that way in this moment? Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm always optimistic. I do think there it's maybe a little bit of a personality thing. And I also really, really appreciate the pessimists and cynics around me. They're extremely important too for um, reality checks, if nothing else. Um, you know, I always feel better when I'm with people who are fighting and someone is always fighting. So, so making sure you know who those people are and where those stories live, where they're getting told. Um, I mean, for me, people don't even always have to win for me to be optimistic. The fact that they're fighting is enough because I know from history that, um, that fighting helps, even if you don't win this time, there's, there's somebody 15 years from now that's gonna take the lessons from your fight under a slightly different set of conditions that you helped create by fighting um, and, and they're gonna get it done. So, so I, I don't feel responsible for everything that helps me take some pressure off myself. And I try to feed myself regularly with um, the stories and experiences and images of people who are fighting. That, that's a great note to end on. Um, I, I love the idea of whatever we're doing now, we might not see the result of it right away, but you are laying the groundwork and, and surrounding ourselves, you know, with people who who feel the same. Um, Rinku, th thank you so much for your time and your insights and um, perspective. And thank you for the work that you continue to do uh, and, uh, and, and for being our guest here. Um, sincerely appreciate it. Um, and just as a reminder to, to everyone on the webinar, we will um, be sending out uh, information on uh, a lot of the um, materials that were mentioned. There are questions about um, research, um, Rinku's books. So we will be sure to send that out. Um, and if you can, please join us on April 23rd and on May 7th, we would love to see you back here. And uh, lastly, but certainly not least, thank you to our sponsors. Um, thank you all for attending and hope to see you soon. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.